and it is beyond that, that slavery mode. We know where that came from, but that's being maintained as the adjutant. The real adjutant is the economics. The slaves already built the greatest economic powerhouse on the planet here. Now, why is it that whites who are now enjoying the privilege of having done that, what is it that whites now are finding out about their condition and their lack of hold on their and the lack of ability for them to enjoy their privilege? What's going on in their minds today? Well, the news is telling them that black is the one responsible for crime. The news is telling us that because they're crazy and they're shooting at us, that somehow it's dealing with racism. Remember, family, even though we hate what they have, have made into this society, we know how this thing runs. If we were left alone, my little wife's mom is new. If we pulled away, we, we would have been more dangerous if we were pulled away and, and built our own society in here. That's why the civil rights movement was actually started, because of what we are and how we are potentially the greatest source of creativity and the greatest source of economic power that the United States of America can ever, ever imagine. So that had to be undermined. It had to be controlled. So the civil rights movement was put together by the Jews in order to undermine our ability to become autonomous and to be self-sufficient. Yeah, you in the Wounded Womb, you gave a, a great, um, some information about, you quoted um, one Aryan um, I'll say leader, for lack of a better term, and then you also turned around and quoted um, a Jewish scholar or a leader, and basically mm -hmm. from, their, from their position, it was like, they're the ones who are really at war, the Aryans and the Jews, and they used the mm -hmm. race for blacks and the whites in order to, um, the Jews are using the race war between the blacks and whites in order to keep them uh, in a subservient position. And just, mm -hmm. and then and then coupling that with what you said about our greatness and them knowing about our greatness, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's both the Aryans and the Jews that are basically kind of trying to keep us underneath and pretend like they're the greatest when they know that it's actually us. Well, based on what it is the Jew has been saying about himself and the ones who have come out and confessed to it, because this is not me saying this, I'm just um, repeating what they are saying. The Jew says that he is the superior. He is the smartest one on the planet, and therefore he is going to rule. His God will come. In fact, he doesn't care about your God. He gave you that God to worship to keep you distracted from the God he's really worshiping, and that's Saturn. That's where the L comes from. L is Saturn. So when you're talking about uh, his, 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 whole, uh, his whole framework for what it is he does, he doesn't care about any heaven that he's telling you will exist outside of the planet. His heaven is here. And he said the only way that he reaches heaven is through hell. So he'll create hell in order to create heaven. You have to understand that mentality. Most people don't understand how that works. And it's brilliant. You've got to look at it as being brilliant, because if you read the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which was supposed to have been written by a Jew, but was actually known to be written by uh, the Jesuits for the Jew, or in touch with the Jew, understand that in the Protocols of Zion, even if you hate everything that's in there, even if it's supposed to be the worst trash that, that you, uh, trashes all Ashkenazis and Khazarian Jews, everything in there is happening today. Period. That's interesting. Well, uh, brother, let me ask you something. Um, um, Sister Zaza had posted something um, that kind of made me have to think twice and go back and look at it. And as I was processing it, we, we went on to, to talk and to do a lecture in uh, Columbia, South Carolina at the uh, Rock and Culture and with, with, uh, for the Good, Ki Good, uh, Good Kids, Inc., and Zaza said the age of Aquarius is not about the merging of the masculine and feminine attributes to create some new androgynous, asexual being. <laughs> he said, cuckoo birds, beware. You want to give the thumbs up to homosexuality. Just keep it, just keep it 100. <laughs> but please stop trying to use metaphysics and prophecy for, um, from our ancestors to agree on to green like this modern age savagery. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think she's on point. Essentially, um, I think that you and I who did that lecture down in Atlanta, 
right. when I began mm -hmm. speaking about um, the, the, the age of Ganymede, actually. Uh, Aquarius being the age of Ganymede. And the story of Ganymede was that he was the son of a uh, Trojan uh, general who was out tending the horses or the sheep or whatever form of livestock. And Zeus came down as a hawk, snatched him up, and raped him uh, continuously until he became essentially the boy toy of the gods. And he was handed to all the different mm. gods. And as a result right. of that, he was given his... Um, his uh, Aquarian, uh, he was given these the stars, the stars that you see, or the house that you see, or the constellation you see as Aquarius was actually after this young god called uh, Ganymede, or this young uh, demigod called Ganymede, who was honored by um, Zeus uh, in this manner. And for his uh, service to all the gods, um, he was then given to be the cupbearer of the gods. And as such, um, the cupbearer essentially was the one who brought the wine to intoxicate the man who was going to actually screw him. So what right. this whole idea behind what uh, Aquarius really meant and why we're seeing this incredible burst and explosion of homosexuality, in fact, I'm talking about diversities that will essentially astound, you know, even the most, uh, you know, uh, unjaded of all, uh, jaded of all of us. And it's so interesting because I, I did a, 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 a I did an analogy to show that during the age of uh, Aquarius or the age of Ganymede, actually being the age of Hapi, by the way, according to the ancient Kemites, but in the age of uh, Ganymede, um, you started seeing a lot of these so-called rappers with the pimp cup, which essentially I showed was. Um, at that time, it started coming out about the homosexuality being rife in the so-called rap community at that time. So I began to show you the connection, the kind of symbolic connection between the cup of Ganymede being held by these pimps and in the rap community and the rampant uh, kind of down low homosexuality was going on. Hmm. So, brother, would you, I mean, just as far as the whole, because I, I run into a lot of sisters that are, are, I mean, like I said, cuckoo birds, um, space cadets, that are basically trying to say that um, because we are at the, you know, we are upon, we are in the dawn of the Aquarius, that this is a time where all of humanity is going to be moving towards a more feminine um, perspective and, and being, and that homosexuality and our men, you know, moving more towards the feminine, feminine aspect of themselves. I mean, is it, is your perspective on the age of Aquarius, are we going back towards a recentering and a realignment, or are we moving more to mm. Yeah, that's interesting you asked that question, a very good question. And if that's the case, that our men are now dressing in skirts and becoming more feminine, then what do they explain the fact that the women are now becoming more masculine? Yes. Mm. Excellent point. Excellent point. So how could they say that we're going feminine? I would think that the women are going to become even more feminine if that's the case. Right. No. What we have is a war going on to destroy the equilibrium of gender. When you destroy the equilibrium of gender, you destroy the polar balance of thinking, of action, of the creativity, all of these things. And of course, there will be some kind of uh, uh, analogy being drawn that supposedly the age of Aquarius now brings us to harmonize the yin-yang properties within us. I am all for the harmonization of the yin-yang property. Get married. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, so now, if, you, if a man wants to know what his yin looks like, look into the eyes of his beloved and, mm. and, and, and just love that because essentially it's been exteriorized from you so that you can see it. It isn't supposed to be you come around so that you now become the feminine and you start bending over because you don't have the, 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 the actual uh, the, the plumbing to be able to do what it is that a woman does. You can only imitate what a woman does. Right. So it's it, it kind of madness that most of these people who come in, these latter-day metaphysicians who have the gay agenda and meta, the, 
the homosexual agenda and they're matching it looking for little pieces of the metaphysical principles so that they can give validity to this perverse activity. No, I am a master metaphysician and I'm saying it because I don't normally do. And anything you can come at me to explain or try to get me to see your side of that type of argument, I'm going to knock down with the facts to tell you, if you're listening in, that you are on, if you are a true metaphysician, you would understand that you are now existing in something called third density. Third density is the place where the creator splits duality so that it can know itself, first and foremost. The duality of the third density is unity. And you can't take that duality into the realm of unity because duality does not fit in the realm of unity. You are in the realm of duality, and it's your actions in the realm of duality as a dual principle of the Creator coming together with that aspect of the Creator that brings the harmony of the One here. Now, you can tell me anything about hermaphrodites and the whole nine yards, but I can also tell you scientifically about why the hermaphrodite came about. Right. So is the third density actually the third dimension? Third density is third dimension. In other words, there are layers to your density. Density is actually um, the pressure. The pressure it's a, third density is a pressurization zone. For instance, the air that you have around you is under 16,000 pounds of square inch of pressure. You can right. feel it when you're driving in a car at 60 miles an hour. You stick your hands out the window. It seems like you're underwater. Well, yes, you are, hmm. but you don't feel it because your body has been pressurized. You are giving off right. a counter-pressure in order to exist. So the pressure of third density and the inner pressure that you are exerting to keep yourself in the living zone, the, uh, in the presence of, of the body that you are, to keep the temple alive, that counter-pressuring is what you call existence in third density. Okay, so now, if we're operating in third density, and third density is unity. How is it that we um, uh, have come under such pressure in this third dimensional paradigm to the point where we know we're preparing fourth and fifth dimensional warfare, psychic warfare? How do we how do we prepare ourselves for this when they're bombarding us with chemtrails and GMOs and the rest of the stuff? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get into that when it comes on, uh, on, on April the 27th in New York. But I will give you this. Okay. The first thing first, your body is an intelligence. Every cell in you is an intelligence. You are the spark that keeps that intelligence in focus. Now, of course, they cripple you with education, what I call education. Not education, but education. They deaden your senses from the time you were a child. They overload it. In fact, they colonize what we call the imagination. They colonize the child's imagination, which is the place where the child formulates an opinion of itself from its outside mm. sources. And that opinion is to match the karmic opinion it made of itself through the thousands, maybe the millions of lives that it has spent within the flesh at different levels and densities of existence. So now here we are in this particular flesh, in what I call penal colony Earth. Here we are right. in the grave under the pressure of gravity, gravity being the grave. Here we are in gravity, in the grave, in a tomb, a walking tomb, that essentially is there to actually come to a place of self-recognition because every one of us is a sensual apparatus for the knowledge and the knowing of the Creator. The Creator doesn't right. create just for happenstance. It's creating so that it will have sensory input based on its creation. So to understand that you are that, you are that creation, you are the creator and the creation, you are the creator folded over onto itself to know itself. Hmm. And in so right. doing, you have done the separation. The very fact that the creator created means it's separated from itself, and that's where we get the duality, the genderizing, all of that. So creation and existence is a polarity experience. Time and right. space. Time itself being another form of an element, because time is an element. Without it, we couldn't exist. Without it, there could be no experience. Without it, there's no categorization of experiences. So right. when we understand time as, as a form of um, an element, like 